Good evening, I'm Jake Fishman reporting for the Regina and Henry Radnitz studio at Yeshiva Yavna in Los Angeles, California. And this is the longest shear ever. We are about to get underway with this incredible and ambitious event, 18 straight hours of Torah given over by Rabbi Shlomo Einhorn. We are working out the last technical kinks now and are scheduled to begin in just a few moments. As many of you know, Rabbi Einhorn is attempting this incredible feat in order to raise awareness and support for Jewish education and to help ensure that Torah education is accessible to all Jewish boys and girls. Remember to donate and be a part of this historical event. Hold on to your hats, folks. It's going to be a wild ride. We go now live to Rabbi Shlomo Einhorn. Hi, welcome to TheLongestShear.com. The Longest Shear, we're trying, we're attempting to do something together to support Jewish education. We're going to go 18 hours, God willing. We start now. Different topic every single hour. Stay close to us. We've already raised $150,000, and we're going for our goal of $250,000, all to support Jewish education. So we need your help not just in the Torah that we're going to be learning tonight, to make, to make Torah great and glorious, but to do something for a bunch of families and a bunch of children that could use a great Jewish education. My name is Rabbi Shlomo Einhorn. I'm reporting here from Yeshiva Yavna. And let's get started. By the way, for those of you who would like to donate, you could donate online by going to longestshear.com where you could watch this also at home, and you're probably watching it now. And you could text me directly at 41444. That's 41444. Text the word Torah, and all the instructions will be texted back to you how to donate through your phone. Other than that, let's get started. Our first topic in the 18 hours is the question of who was the greatest? Who really was the greatest? I mean, we talk about Moshe being one of the great leaders of the Jewish people. We talk about King David being one of the great ones. We talk about Aaron. We talk about Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Rachel, Sarah, Rivka, Leah. Who was, in fact, the greatest? Who would our tradition say that was the great one? All right, let's explore that question. And if there's any way to figure out an answer. You see, who are we to decide on who's the greatest? How are we to sit here 2015 and judge who we think is the greatest? So we're not going to judge. Instead, I'll allow a medrash to do the talking. Medrash is usually a collection of rabbinic teachings based on scriptural sources to give us an indication or a deepening of the text. The medrash rabbah on the book of Dvarim, written around 10 CE, 10th century CE, just to get an understanding of what that means, around the same time, we believe, playing cards was invented, paper money was invented. That's when the medrash rabbah on Sefer Dvarim was put together. The Medrash Rabbah says as follows, on Parshat Vezot Bracha, so it's there all the way at the end of the Torah. Rabot banot asuchayel va'at alit akulana, quoting a verse from Mishle, Proverbs, that many, many of the daughters were valiant, asuchayel va'at alit akulana, but you are the greatest of them all. Right? We know that from the Eshet Chayel prayer that we say at the Shabbos table on Friday nights, we say that line, Rabos banos asu chayel ve'at alit al kulana. You are the greatest. So who is that a reference to, says the Medrash? It's, it's speaking about somebody in particular. Mahu va'at alit al kulana. What does it mean you are greater than all the others? Medaber be blank. I'm skipping the next word in the Medrash. Those who have the Medrash open in front of them could cheat. But I don't want to give you the answer till the end of this hour. You are the greatest is speaking about somebody in particular. We're going to see who that is. We're going to learn together, figure out who, does our, who do the rabbis consider to be the greatest in our entire tradition. So, Ketzat, how is it that that person is the greatest? So, Adam Arishon Omar Lamosha comes along Adam and he says to Moshe. Moshe is the final spokesman of the Torah, so to speak. Adam turns to Moshe and he says, Ani gadol mimeka, I am greater than you. Why? Now let's, let's get an idea here. Is this really happening? Is there this back and forth dialogue between the different great ones? 
we're supposed to understand this like many midrashim in a sense as an allegory. They didn't exist at the same time. Adam exists in a different period of time, obviously, than Moshe Rabbeinu. But rather, there is a hypothetical discussion, and we're going to use the Torah to understand which one, in fact, is the greatest. So Amr Lamosha Ani Gadol Mecca, I am greater than you, says Adam. Why? Shinivrati Shel Baruchu, because I was created first in the image of God. By the way, what does that mean? If we're talking about somebody being the greatest of all time, how could they turn and say, I'm greater than you? Wouldn't that already, that lack of humility already eliminate them from contention? So I'd like to take a moment and really think about what it means. What it means, humility, anivas, from the eyes of the Torah. Rashi to Bamidbar, Perik Yudbet, Pasuk Gimel. Let me get out my Tanakh over here. Got a great new Tanakh. Okay. Rashi to Bamidbar, Perik Yud, Perik Yud Bet Pasuk Gimel says as follows. You know what? Anav Meod by Moshe, it says that he was Anav Meod Mikol Adam. He was humbler than anybody. What does that mean? Rashi says, Shafel Visavlan. He was lowly, of, he kept himself low. Visavlan, he was tolerant. He was tolerant. The Sefer Orchat Sadikim, a Musar classic written in the 16th century. Do you at home know who the author is? You probably don't because nobody does. We don't know who wrote the Sefer Orchat Sadikim. Orchat Sadikim says the definition of a humble person according to Judaism is a Moshel Barucho, somebody who has control of their spirit, meaning somebody who's out of control or a narcissist. They, you know, they don't know the border or the boundary in conversations or when to stop. They allow themselves to constantly unravel because things need to be about them. But not the humble person. Such a person is Moshel Barucho. Rav Eliyahu Rogler. Rav Eliyahu Rogler, he was born 1794. His father was a major scholar who ran a hotel. And he was sent, he sent his son to go learn by the great Rav Chaim Velazhener, the preeminent student of the Vilna Gon. He's called Rav Eliyahu Rugler because he was appointed the Rav in the town of Ragoli, Rav of Slobodka and Kalish. He has the following idea, very unique insight on the idea of humility. The Gemara in Sota 49b, that's what many in the Dafyomi have just concluded. So the Gemara in Sota 49b finishes with an interesting statement. Closes like this. Mishemet Rebbe, when Rebbe Yehuda Hanasi passed away, Batla Anava, humility has died, humility has gone, and Yirat Chait, and fear of sin. Amr le Rav Yosef Latana, lo titne Anava, don't say that humility is gone, Deika Ana. You still have Anna. Anna means myself. But I'm still here. How could you say humility's gone? I'm still around. So Ravelia Rogler says, that's a funny statement. How could he say humility's gone? It's me. It's me. So Ravelia Rogler's answer is that they're actually, if you look in the Yerushalmi, there's someone by the name of Anna. Anna's his name. He's quoted many times in the Yerushalmi. So now this Gemar and Sota reads differently. Amr le Rav Yosef Latana. Rav Yosef says to the Tana, Lo titne Don't say that humility ceased to be. Deik Anna. Not that there's me, but Anna. There's a guy named Anna. The famous Rabbi Anna. He's still around. He's the humble one. But with these different explanations uh, that we've suggested, it could simply be that Judaism has a different understanding of humility. Humility is not the denial of one's capabilities. Humility is not the denial of certain character traits. Rather, what humility is all about, humility is acknowledging what you are, what you're capable of, but at the same time agreeing that you could have done so much more, that there was so much more that you were capable of, that you could have done. So with that being said, let's go back to our Medrash. Adam says, you're not, you know what? I'm greater than you. Why? I was created in the image of God. I was created in the image of God. How do we know that? Because it says, Man was created in God's image. Now, don't we believe we're all created in God's image? Why is that Adam's trump card, his strong argument to Moshe? What I think he means is, we're all the second printing. You understand? The first stamp, so to speak, from God's image into a human being was Adam. After Adam, we're just the copies of the original. 
You know, you hand out an original source sheet. Everybody else has the copy in their hands. We're simply the copy. So Adam is saying, I'm the original production. Okay, you're second printing, Moshe. That's what makes me the greatest. I'm closest, closest to God. There's merit to his argument. We have a tradition in our heritage called Yeridas Hadoros, that as the generations move on, there is a descent. And that is prim primarily because we're further from God, so to speak, further removed from the original inception of humanity, original inception. I want to say one more point here. Adam comes back and says, I am the greatest. Now, the context for this medrash is vizot habracha. This is the blessing that Moshe gave to the Jewish people. What, in a sense, they're really fighting about is not who's the greatest, just to say I'm the greatest. What they're really fighting about here in an allegorical sense is who should be the one that gives the blessing to the Jewish people as a whole. So I would argue humility needs to take a back seat. When you are fighting over the honor and the privilege to be able to bless the Jewish people, to give them this special transferring of energy, so to speak, if somebody has some extra skill or talent, they need to get up and say so. It's not a time to be quiet. And I think that could also explain why everyone here keeps getting up and saying, I should be the one who does it. Okay, let's continue in the Medrash. At that point, Moshe turns back to Adam and he says, I understand your argument, but ani nitaliti yotarimemcha. I am greater than you. Why? Because kavod shaniten lacha nitalimemcha. The kavod that was given to you, Adam, that great kavod that was given to you, that was taken away. It was taken away at a certain point. Shanemar, right, as we're told, that Adam, so to speak, had a, you know, he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. You lost your special spot that you had, and therefore it can't be Adam. As great as Adam Harishan was, he cannot, he cannot be the one um, that's in the running anymore. Let's continue. Who's up to bat next? Then Noah Amar Lamoshe. Next, Noah turns to Moshe and he says, Ani gadol mi Mecca. I am greater than you. Shinitzalti mi dor hamabul. Because I was saved from the generation of the flood. I'm a survivor. He's the, Noah is, when we talk about survivors, Noah is the first survivor. That's who Noah is. By the way, just you taking Adam as being the first person and arguing that it was me because I was created in God's image. You should know that's a very important concept in Jewish mysticism. I think at four o'clock we're talking about Kabbalah or five o'clock. Maybe the 5 a.m. Uh, shear is going to be about Kabbalah. But the topic of being closer to God is really called the concept of Chachma Ilah or Hishtalshus, Hishtalshalus Haolamos. There's an idea that the way this world got here is a trickle down from a very spiritual and powerful world. The world we're looking at now is a trickle down from the world that once was, or God's conception of a world. Meaning God conceived of a world, it was put into play, and the world that we have now is a far cry from the original source. So Adam is saying, I'm closer to the original source. But ultimately, Moshe doesn't argue. Moshe says, I agree, you are close to the original source, but you blew it. So Noah says, I didn't blow it. I was saved from the flood. I am the first survivor. You know, there's something to be said for being a survivor. I mean, it's the tremendous merit of those who survived the generation after the Shoah. Um, I call them the untouchable generation. You don't ask questions about their observance. Um, the fact that they observe anything after having gone through the Shoah is a tremendous miracle, is a tremendous nace. And ultimately, Noah is using that argument, it seems to me, the argument, I'm a survivor. You know what, Moshe, what did you survive from? I, I, survived, I survived this flood. I came out, I came out alive, and I survived this flood. Moshe turns back to Noah, and he says, Amrle Moshe, you saved yourself. And, but you did not have the power to save your generation. I saved myself and I saved my generation when they were about to be killed. Noah, of course, got on the ark and no one came with him besides the family. He couldn't save the generation. Moshe says, I pulled all the people out of Egypt. By the way, something interesting is... Noah uses an argument that I was saved from the flood. You know, I, I came out. Moshe was too. Remember, Moshe as a baby was put in a little boat in the water. So what was Noah thinking? Why did Noah think I, had a, I, I got a great argument here? 
I came out of the waters alive. Moshe also came out of the waters alive. Moshe was put in there as a baby and he was saved from the water the same way that Noah was. Noah seems to have then no merit to his argument. One could argue there's a difference. Moshe was a baby. There was no actual decision by Moshe to trust God and get into the little boat. Moshe was a baby. Noah, on the other hand, made a decision as an adult. I'm going to trust God. This is the way out. The way of God is the way out of, uh, of this generation. And Noah made a choice to get on the boat. And that was ultimately Noah's argument um, back to Moshe. That was Noah's argument back to Moshe. By the way, I heard a teaching from the Maral. What does Moshe's name mean? So Moshe's name is an Egyptian name. The Torah tells us it's because the daughter of Paro pulled him out from the water. Ki min hamayim mishisihu, that from the water he was drawn out, he was pulled out. The Maral says, what water was he pulled out from? You know what he's pulled out from? He was pulled out from the water of the flood. That the Maral said there is a connection between the nature of Moshe, Noah. The moment Noah was saved from that flood, there was a power in the world at that moment that enabled Moshe to be saved uh, many years later. There's a lot of literature out there on the connection between Moshe and Noah, um, looking at the two of them and how they play off of each other. Share with you the Meshe Chachma for a moment. The Meshe Chachma is written by Rav Meir Simcha of Davinsk. Rav Meir Simcha of Davinsk was the chief rabbi of the town of Riga um, right at the end of the 19th century. Um, Riga had the distinction of having two great rabbis in its town, one Hasidic and one non-Hasidic. The non-Hasidic was the Meshechachma. The Hasidic one was the Rogachover. Um, it was one of the rare instances at that time where you had sort of two powerful figures from different ends of the spectrum, and they, they were best of friends. They got along perfectly, um, the Rogachover and the Meshechachma. So I'm going to share with you the Meshechachma to Parshat Noach. This is a classic. He says as follows. It says at the end, after Noah comes off the ark, it says, Noah became sort of a man of the earth. He planted a tree, so on and so forth. So he says like this, Chaviv Moshe mi Noach. Moshe is more beloved than Noah. Why? Noah mishenikra ish tzadik. Noah starts, be, starts by being called a righteous man at the beginning of the Parsha. At the end, his name changes to Ish Adama, the man of the earth. Moshe goes the opposite direction. He starts off being called Ish Mitzri, the Egyptian guy. And then at the end of his life, he's called Ish Elohim. He's called the man of God. He's called the man of God. It's interesting. It's all about the direction you're moving in. It's not about what you are right now. It's about the direction that you're going. For example, Rav Dessler raises the question of why, how does it work with reward? Let's say you have somebody who's been righteous their whole life and they do X versus someone who's never been righteous at all and suddenly they wake up one day and they say, I want to put on tefillin today. So Rav Dessler says the reward for that person who's never been righteous and suddenly puts on tefillin is greater than the other person. It's a Gemara in Brachos. But makom shabale tshuva, makom shabale tshuva omdim, in a place where a bal tshuva stands, ein tzadikim um, yechol omed. The righteous can't stand in that place. The bal tshuva has a special merit. So why is that? Rav Dessler says, why is that fair? This guy's been a goody two-shoes. His whole life he's been good. Suddenly this Johnny come lately walks right in, puts on tefillin, and suddenly he gets the whole fanfare and all the reward. Sir so Dessler lays out his famous battlefield analogy. Works as follows. Sign of greatness in our life is not whether or not I'm going to eat a piece of kosher food or treif. That's not a struggle. I've been eating kosher my whole life. It's not a question. I'm not going to eat treif. It's not a challenge. We are rewarded by the areas in our lives that are our battlefield. The battlefield. The battlefield of Bechira. The battlefield of choice. Those pockets are what define our greatness. They're what make us great. For the person who's never been religious for his entire life and suddenly decides to put on tefillin, that's his new battle. That is his new battle. It's his new battlefield. He shifted it. And our goal is to constantly move our battlefield to a higher and higher area so our struggles are shifted to a different area or a different sphere. So what's interesting is Noah starts Ish Tzadik, but his title changes to Ish Adama. Moshe starts as Ish Mitzri, but he ends up Ish Elohim. What does that mean? 
So says the Meshech Chachma, drachim ba'avodet Hashem. There are two paths in the service of God. One way is somebody who miyached atzmo la'avodah, so yisparach, someone who serves God in isolation. And then there is one who serves God as far as the tzibur, the community. And he nullifies himself for the purpose. It's a great line. Mavatil atzmo bishvil klal. He nullifies himself for the masses. Umafkir nafsho avuram. He gives up his soul, everything, for the people. That's why Moshe became great. That's for all of us to hear. The person who gives up everything on behalf of Klal Yisrael, on behalf of the community, that's what takes you from an Ish Mitzri to an Ish Elokim. Noah was great. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Noah was incredible. But the difference was Noah's service was focused on his orbit, his family, his own. And that's why he went from Ish Tzadik to Ish Hadama. So back to our local discussion. Noah says, Moshe, I'm greater than you. I'm a survivor. Noah, uh, Noah said that to Moshe. Moshe says, I know you're a survivor, but I also survived. I was raised in the house of Paro, and I rebelled against that, and I came out, and I saved the Jewish people, and I pulled them out. I didn't just save myself. I pulled out the entire Jewish people. So cross off our list, Adam Arishon, cross off our list. Um, now, Noah, who was the greatest? Let's continue. After that, here we go. Lama uh, Davar Dome. By the way, he has a great analogy here in the Medrash. Lama Hadavar Dome. What is this like? What is this comparable to? Lishte Svinot Shayu Biyam. Two boats in the ocean. And there's two captains. One saves himself, but doesn't save his boat. One saves himself and his entire boat. Lami Hayu Makalsin. Who do we praise? Not the one who jumped off himself, right? There was that guy, we don't have to name him, right? The guy who jumped off the cruise, the Italian guy. You saw him like jumping off the back of the cruise there and let everybody sink. And versus the guy who worried about, I said, I'm staying with the ship. Reminds me of the Eish Kodesh. The Eish Kodesh, Rav Klonimus Kalman of Piazetna. He had numerous opportunities to be smuggled out of the Warsaw Ghetto. He said, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving till all the Jews are allowed to come out with me. I'm staying with my people. And he did. He stayed till the very end. Moshe took out himself and his people. Now, the next one, now we're really getting, we're getting to Lahavdil, really like the Babe Ruth. We're getting to the all-star game now. Avram Avinu. So let's go. Let's stand toe-to-toe. -to -toe. We got Avram Avinu going up against Moshe. Avram Amar Lamosha. Avram turns to Moshe and he says, Ani Gadol Mimeka. I am greater than you. Why? Shahayiti zan laovrim uleshavim. I took care of, I fed those who would come and go. I gave them a meal to eat. Avram is known for his outstanding chesed. By the way, this is now finally a very frightening argument. Why? Because in Judaism, chesed wins. Let's be honest, chesed wins. How many times in Tanakh does God say, I don't want your korbanas, I'd rather you just be good to each other. Tzion b'mishpat tipada. Zion will be redeemed through mishpat, through justice, through being good to one another. So Avram is waving the chesed card. That really has not been used yet. Until now we had survivor, until now we had I'm the original imprint of God. But Avram says, I took care of other people. When they were, we know, we know that when Avram just had a bris milah in the heat of the day, Avram was there waiting. Avram was there waiting to find the opportunity to be able to give to, be able to, give to somebody else. That's Avram's argument. I mean, it, Avram could have gone, you know, if, we should ask Dershowitz which argument he would have used for each person because you have some great arguments for Avram. Avram passed the 10 tests. I mean, the, the Mishnah is in Pirkei Avos, the last chapter, tells you, Asara Nisyonis Nisnasa Avram Avinu, that there were 10 tests that Avram went through, and he passed them all with flying colors. He did some amazing stuff. He was thrown into the Kivshana Eish with Nimrod because he wanted to stand up for monotheism. Avram doesn't go with that. I find it fascinating. By the way, if the whole shear was just about that, we'd have a shear. Avram doesn't use any of his other arguments that he could have gone with. He uses one I gave people a meal. It's unbelievable. We're always looking for the big thing, the big, the big act that we could do, the big mitzvah that we could do. You know what the biggest mitzvah you could do is? Quite simply, provide somebody else a meal. Give something for somebody else. That's Avram's argument. 
He could have gone with the, by the way, if I was Avram, I would have said Akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. What greater test is there in humanity? I mean, how much has been written? Think Kierkegaard wrote a whole book on the test of Avram, Abraham and Isaac. And Avram doesn't even bring that up here in the Medrash. It's inconsequential. I'm going to bring up Chesed. If I got one argument to make, it's the Chesed I do. I find that fascinating um, that Avram wants to use that as his main argument. Um, the list of Avram's 10 tests that he passed, it's a controversial list. There's a little bit of a debate what exactly are the 10. Um, Rabbeinu Yonah, in his commentary to Pirkei Avos, Rabbeinu Yonah places the ninth test as the Akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, and the 10th test, Avram working to find a burial plot for his wife, Sarah. That he puts at number 10. So it's, that list is kind of strange. I mean, after you've been through after you've been through the binding of Isaac, that test where he had to offer his son, so to speak, what kind of test was it that he found a place to bury his wife? Who doesn't? It seems like it's, that's, a, that's a common act that I assume anybody uh, would work on if given the chance. So putting aside what was involved in purchasing Mara Tamach Pela as a test, the question is, why do you have a test which seems less than the Akedas Yitzchak after the Akedas Yitzchak? So... There are a couple approaches to this question. One, there's a concept in education called the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development means that the best place to educate children or to test them is in the sweet spot. The sweet spot is the zone, meaning if you're constantly testing them in information that's way too easy, it never tests what they're able to do. If it's too difficult, you don't test anything either. It's just frustrating. They lose their confidence. You need to find that area to test them that's just a little bit up there, a little bit out of the reach. There's a beautiful Mahalik. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says, you know, when he was asked, where should I put the mezuzah on the door for my children? Right? You want the kids to learn the mitzvah of the, and the beautiful idea to kiss the mezuzah. So should I put the mezuzah for a kid's door to their bedroom? Should I drop it lower down? Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says, no, you still put it on the top third of the doorpost. Why? Because a child needs to know to still reach, to reach up, to strive for greatness, to strive to be better, to reach out, to suddenly watch themselves grow as they get closer and closer to that mezuzah. So in education, we have this concept of zone of proximal development, trying to find the sweet spot, the right place to educate. The Akedas Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, was not within the zone of proximal development. It was so big, it was so outlandish, it was so beyond anything anybody's ever been asked for that it doesn't give you a good read of what Avraham was truly about. Let's give Avraham a test that's more within range to understand what Avraham is. And that was the test of the, of the Marata Machpelah, of purchasing a, an area for Sarah. An alternative answer, I would suggest, is the following. Um, Lahavdil, if I may use this analogy, is I remember um, it was Shabbos morning, walking on the way to Shul, and you see the front of the newspaper on the floor, and it was something that I never thought I'd see. It was Mike Tyson on the floor, right? Anybody who had seen him go, you, you, fights were over in literally a minute and 30 seconds. But suddenly there was the image of Mike Tyson on the floor. He just lost to Buster Douglas. What happened? How did the great one just fall? So the answer there, looking back, what history tells us is that Mike Tyson had gone as far as anybody can go. But what happens when you reach the top? What happens when you reach the greatest point? What happens when you hike up the Kilimanjaro? Do you stay strong or do you let your guard down? And that's what happened. At a certain point, Mike Tyson got as far as he can go that he no longer stayed with that same edge, that same energy, that same will to fight. And therefore, it began to fall apart. He lost his edge. We say, Mi ya'ale bahar Hashem in the Medrash. Who can go up to the mountain of God? Umi yakum bim kom kocho. And who could stay up there? It's one thing to go up there. That's one level. But it's another thing to be able to stay up there. That's another madrega. That's a whole other level to be able to do it. And therefore, I think that's, in a sense, this test for the Marat HaMachpelah. Avram had got to the highest point possible. He did the Akedas Yitzchak. There's nothing else greater than that. And the question is, was Avram going to stay as great as he always was? 
or was he begin, you know, was he going to begin to relent? Was he going to begin to give in and lose his edge? And the answer, he's going to stay as great as he always was, as he always was. Let's continue. Let's move ahead. So Avram turns and says, hey, I, do, I did chesed. I provided meals for somebody when they would pass by. Moshe says, Ani nitalesi yoster mimeka. I'm greater than you. Why? Haiti zan bnei adam arelim vani haiti zan bnei adam mahulin. I, you see, you were feeding a pagan world. I had the privilege of feeding our people, of taking care of the Jewish family. That was an opportunity that you did not have. Velo od, and not only that, at haiti zan bi yishuv vani haiti zan bamidbar. You fed people in more cultivated areas. It's one thing that you set up meals where there was stuff around you. But I was in the middle of nowhere. I was in the middle of the Midbar and I fed people there in the wilderness. What's it talking about? What did Moshe, who did Moshe feed in the wilderness? It was manna. God sent down manna from heaven. So the Midrashim teach us that that manna came down in the merit of Moshe. Moshe, it was there because of Moshe's greatness. And that's what Moshe means. Moshe kept the people at a certain level that allowed God's bounty to come down into the world. And that's why, that's precisely why Moshe had the upper edge. Let's move on. So down is Adam, down is Noah, Adam Arishon, I mean, uh, Avram Avinu, even Abraham couldn't stand up to Moshe. Now, Yitzchak Amar Lamoshe. Yitzchak says to Moshe, Ani Godol Mimeka. I am greater than you. Why? Shepashatiti Tzavari Al Gabe Mizbeach Vereiti Et Pnei I stuck my neck out on the Mizbeach and I saw the divine presence. This is fascinating on a few levels. What's he? I stuck my neck on the Mizbeach. He's referring to the binding of Isaac, the Akedah Yitzchak. So again, it's interesting that Avram didn't bring it up and Yitzchak did. When, by the way, everybody and their cousin see it as Avram's greatest moment and not Yitzchak's. Yitzchak was either a little kid then or he didn't fully comprehend what was going on. But either way, Yitzchak brings it up, but he's got a twist. He doesn't just bring it up. He says, and I saw the face of the Shekhinah. Now think about that. This adds a new dimension to the Akedat Yitzchak story that we've never had before. We never look at the Akedat Yitzchak from the eyes of Yitzchak. What did Yitzchak see when his neck was on the Mizbeach? There's a Medrash that says at that moment, a tear came down from an angel and landed in Yitzchak's eye. This Medrash is saying, at that moment when Avram's knife went up, you can imagine the sun reflecting off the knife into Yitzchak's eyes. And at that moment, Yitzchak saw the face of the Shechina. So good trivia question. If somebody asks you, who was the first person to see the Pnei HaShechina, the face of the Shechina, directly? The answer is in this Medrash. It's Yitzchak. It's actually Yitzchak. At the moment he saw his father lift up the knife, that was the moment um, he saw the Pnei HaShechina. So he says, my neck was on the Mizbeach. He needs two arguments. My neck was on the Mizbeach, and I saw the Pnei HaShechina. I think it's one argument. He's not arguing that I stuck my neck on the Mizbeach. It wasn't his choice. His father put him there. He's arguing the second part. I was greater, because I have seen the face of the Shechina. By the way, if you look in the Torah, there actually is so little about Yitzchak compared to Avram and Yaakov. Yitzchak has really, if you add up the lines in the screenplay, um, Avram and Yaakov have so much more airtime than Yitzchak. So much more. Why is that? So again, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says, the reason why there's so little about Yitzchak is because Avraham was the mode of chesed, of kindness, which we already saw. We're going to get to Yaakov. Yaakov is called Tiferet, a very positive, a very positive um, ability and skill. Yitzchak is called Gvura, power, strength. Yitzchak's a very difficult personality, very tough, very hard. Pachad Yitzchak, fear of Yitzchak. 
Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky says, the Torah wanted to minimize the role of pachad in Judaism versus the more positive roles of chesed and, and tiferet. You understand, it's very important about the identity of the Jew. The Jew is supposed to have strength. The Jew is supposed to have gvura. The Jew is supposed to have heroics and all of that. But that needs to be muted compared to the midah of chesed and to the midah of tiferet. The midah of kindness, of love, of splendor. All of that needs to be much more highlighted than the midah of, than the midah of pachad. There's a role for pachad in Judaism, but it cannot dominate. It cannot overwhelm. It needs to be tempered. It needs to be held at bay. And that's why, says Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, um, it was let, it was, you know, Yitzchak is kept to a minimum. You think about that today in modern context, the Jewish people are not known for the radicalism. And, and that's part of the story. We need to be known for our chesed. We need to be known for kindness. We need to be known for splendor and creativity. And that's what Yaakov Kamenetsky is, um, is saying. Okay, one other note about the Akedas Yitzchak. I just find it interesting, and I leave this out there, that it's, it's, it's referred to by Yitzchak's name. Even though it's Avram's big story, it's never called the Akeda of Avraham. It's called Akeda Yitzchak. So Yitzchak's name is in the movie, but it really is always seen as Avram's great, uh, great action. Just something to think about, that why isn't it seen as Yitzchak's great moment? And if it's not, don't call it Akeda Yitzchak. Call it the Akedah of Avraham, the binding, you know, it's about Yitzchak, but the Akedah Shel Avraham. Okay, let's continue. Who do we got now? Who's up next to the plate? Next up. Oh, by the way, what was Moshe's argument back to Yitzchak, right? Yitzchak says, I saw God's face. Moshe says, Ani nita leiti yosir mecha, I am greater than you. You know why? Sha'ata re'ita pnei ashchina. Because you saw the face of the Shechina, the Kohei Necha, and your eyes were never the same. You couldn't handle it. We know Yitzchak lost his eyesight. It says in Breshit Chavzayin, V'hi ki zakein Yitzchak, when Yitzchak was old, v'techehena enav, and his eyes were weaker. So Moshe says, you know why your eyes were weaker? You couldn't handle the Shechina. This Medrash aside, the other Medrash I quoted before, says Yitzchak's eyes were weaker because the angels tear went into Yitzchak's eye. This Medrash is assuming that Yitzchak's uh, blindness or his inability to see is not because of that, but rather it's because he couldn't handle the radiance of, the God, of God's Shekhinah. Moshe says, you couldn't handle looking. I, on the other hand, I looked. Ani hayiti medaber im ha I spoke with the Shekhinah. Panim be panim, face to face. Velo kahu eni. My eyes never went dim. My eyes never went dim. That's Moshe's argument back to Yitzchak. We're up to Jacob now, Yaakov. Yaakov Amar Lemosha. Ani gadol mimeka, I am greater than you. Why? Shinifgashti im hamalach. Venitzachti oso. Yaakov says, I fought with the angel. I had a battle. Great story of Jacob going back to get his pachim ketanim, to go back to get the little jugs. And there he is at night fighting the angel. And I beat him. I was victorious over him. By the way, the fact that it says that he won, that's controversial. Who won the battle of the angel? I mean, it seems to us that he won. But from the text, it's not clear at all. Um, who is the winner in that instance, in that fight? I mean, the angel does suddenly disappear and Moshe's wounded. But from this Medrash, you see it's understanding. I mean, sorry, not Moshe. Yaakov is wounded. But from this Medrash, it seems that Yaakov did win the fight. And that's how we would like to, that's how we'd like to read it. Let's talk about this fight. It's a great passage from Rav Soloveitchik summarizing this fight. Let me read it to you. Was Yaakov's victory something to be expected? Was it logical? Of course not. He was alone, weak, and unarmed in the art of warfare. Yaakov acted absurdly and contrary to all material practical considerations. In other words, he acted heroically. He who had displayed so much business acumen and keenness of a pragmatic mind in the house of Lavan, Suddenly in the darkness, 
of a grisly, strange night. He made the leap into the absurd. What Yaakov manifested was not koach, power, but rather gvura, heroism, which is always employed when reason disappears and logic retreats. At daybreak, he found himself the victor. Is this merely the story of one individual experience? Is it not, in fact, the story of Knesset Yisrael, an entity which is engaged in absurd struggle for thousands of years? That's a beautiful way to depict the battle of Yaakov. The battle of Jacob in the book is not about Jacob and some random angel. It is the struggle of the Jewish people, a survival, a constant need to struggle, to survive, to be alive, to be here in this world. That's the story of our people. I'll give you one more thought on Yaakov's battle with the angel. See, there's a turning point in the struggle. Yaakov asks the angel, what's your name? And the angel says, Lama zeti shalishmi. Why are you asking me my name? And suddenly the angel, that's the turning point. The angel freaks out and the angel's gone and it fights over. And it says, Vayizrach lo Hashemesh, and the sun began to shine. What was wrong with that question? Why couldn't he ask what his, well, first of all, why did he need to know his name? And number two, why when suddenly he asked the angel, what's your name? The angel got all freaked out. He bugged out and he said, I'm out of here. So Rav Shalom Shwadron, the great storyteller of Jerusalem, says as follows. He gives a story, an analogy. Take a farm boy who's never been to the city before in his life comes to the city for the first time and he's excited. He's excited by everything he sees. All the lights, all the hustle and bustle and the sounds and cars. He's never seen all this. It's amazing. And all of a sudden he sees a long line outside of a building and he decides to get in line and he's going to follow it through. And the line starts going one by one. They're paying someone at the front. They're getting a ticket and they're walking into a room. He sits down in a room. It's a blank wall. And suddenly the lights go down and the wall lights up. And what appears on the wall? It's the Yetzir Hara, the evil inclination. And he loves it. Can't get enough. He's looking at it. This is amazing. It's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen before. It's incredible. He wants more of it. He says, why are we looking at it in the dark? Quickly, he runs to the back. He turns on the light and suddenly it's gone. What is that analogy all about? Rav Shalom Shradran says that Jacob's battle was with the darkest part of himself, the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. You know how you beat your demons? You find out what the source is. Where does it come from? Why do I have this struggle? Why do I have this problem? What is there in my past that is making me think and feel this way? What's your name? When he asked, what's your name? He wasn't just asking some detail about an angel, what's your name? But rather he was trying to find out about his identity. Who are you? At your essence, what are you about? That's why the angel freaked out. That's why the angel couldn't handle it. The angel was like, what are you asking me? Stop. Because he knew the moment Yaakov finds out what this is all about, there is no more battle anymore. It's over. And that's the idea. Lama zeti shalishmi. Why are you asking me my name? The Maral says the word for name in Hebrew is shame. Shame means sham, your destination. It tells you about your destiny. It tells you what you're truly about. Now what's Moshe's argument going to be back to this? This is a great argument. I fought with the angel. I faced to face against the Sarah Shalesav, the angel of Esav. There I was. I looked it in the eye. Moshe comes back and says the following. See, Amr lo Moshe, atani fgashta im hamalach bepir borin shalcha. You fought the angel in your home court. Ani ola etzlon bepir borin shalahen. I went to fight the angels in their turf. Vehein mitiaren mimeni, and they were afraid of me. They were afraid of me. What does that mean? What's he talking about? 
There are numerous passages in the Talmud, numerous Gemaras, where we find Moshe in a struggle with the angels. For example, one passage in the Talmud says the angels didn't want the Jews to receive the Torah. Who are human beings to receive such a Torah? But the angel, but Moshe was a defender of the faith. And Moshe said, these people deserve the Torah. They're the ones who, are, who deserve to have it. Moshe was the one who literally went and he fought with the angels. He went up there to disagree with them. There's a Pusik in Psalms, in Tehillim. Let me share that with you. Tehillim Samachet, 68. This is a reference, I believe, to Moshe's struggles with the angels, right? The Medrash, the, the Pasuk in Tehillim says, Malke tzavakos yudodun yudodun. The, the angel, the head of the hosts of the angels, they were with me. And our tradition teaches us that's a, a reference to Moshe who really sparred, right? Malke tzavakos yudodun yudodun, right? The Koran translates it as, here it is, the king of armies. King of armies, they run, they run. They translate it as run, meaning the angels, they were afraid of me, says Moshe. They were scared of me, and they went scurrying. They ran away. So Moshe turns back and says, listen, Yaakov, I know you fought an angel. First of all, you fought them down here on earth. I went up to the Shemayim, Ola ad kisa harakia. I went up to the firmament in the sky and I faced these angels and they ran away from me. So now Yaakov is, uh, Yaakov is sort of pushed aside. By the way, this idea of Moshe going up. We know of Moshe going up from numerous instances. One of my favorite instances is the Gemara in Menachos 29b. The Gemara says that that when Moshe went up, so Moshe Matzah Kadosh Baruch Hu Koshrin Ksarim La Osios Liksarim. Moshe found God sewing crowns onto the letters of the Torah. You ever see inside a Torah scroll? There's little tagin, there's little crowns on top of the letters. So Moshe finds God sewing crowns onto the letters. And he asks God, God, Mima Akiv Al Yatcha, who are you doing this for? So God says, that there's going to be someone in many generations from now whose name is Akiva ben Yosef Shemo. His name is Akiva, the son of Yosef. And it's because of him, he's going to darshan tile tile halachas minosis. He's going to darshan thousands of halachas from these crowns. So Moshe says, Hareuli, show him to me. I, I want to meet him. God says, Chazor la'acharecha, turn around. And he takes Moshe into a time machine. By the way, I've looked it up. That is the oldest reference to time travel in any form of literature. Any literature, Jewish or non-Jewish, the oldest reference to some sort of time travel or moving into different periods of history is that passage in the Gemara Menachas where Moshe asks God, let me see this Akiva ben Yosef. The Gemara continues and tells us that Moshe ends up in the eighth row of Akiva's classroom. Why the eighth row? Unclear. It could be the, um, the Marsha says that there was a reference to Moshe's humility. He was further back. Fine. Moshe's in the classroom and he's listening to Akiva teach. And Moshe doesn't understand a single word of what Akiva's talking about. And it says, Toshash Koho, his legs go weak. Suddenly somebody raises his hand in Rabbi Akiva's classroom and says, Where'd you learn this from? And Akiva says, I learned it, it's the Torah from Moshe. And suddenly Moshe felt much better. He comes out of the time machine and he says to God, he's blown away by this Akiva. He says, God, you have someone as great as this and you want me to give the Torah? It should be Akiva. And God in the Talmud utters the famous words, Shtok, keep quiet. Kach aleb machshava lefanai. That's the way I wanted it to be. I want it to come from a, you, not Akiva. Strange Gemara, very strange. Ramosha Feinstein 
in the introduction to his Igris Moshe, which are his classic responsa, his classic letters, he brings this Gemara and he asks a bunch of questions on it. Number one, what does it mean that there's going to be somebody in many generations from now who's going to learn tons of laws from these crowns? You know how many laws we have in the Talmud from these crowns? Zero. Absolutely not one. So what does it mean? Akiva is going to come and learn thousands of halachas. Number two, how come when Moshe didn't understand what was going on in the class and Akiva says, it's halacha la Moshe Messinai, it's halacha passed on from Moshe, suddenly Moshe felt better. I'd feel worse that it's someone quoting me, but I don't understand the word of it. I wouldn't feel better. I'd feel much worse. So what does that mean? Really, there's, there's, there's 10 questions you could ask on this passage in the Gemara. What is it talking about? So Ramosha Feinstein answers in the following way. Moshe was nervous. He's sitting in Rabbi Akiva's classroom. And you know why he doesn't understand anything? Because they're talking about Torah as it applies to that generation. Like imagine somebody from 100 years ago, a great rabbi, sitting in a class today. They wouldn't understand. You know why? Because we'd be talking about how to be, you know, how to be good with our business as far as internet commerce. We'd be talking about Judaism applied to new situations. And therefore, that person from 100 years ago wouldn't even know what we're talking about. We'd be talking about whether or not there's something called a kosher Shabbos switch on Shabbos and why you can't use it. These kind of things wouldn't make sense to somebody 100 years ago. But the principles are the same. So Moshe is there in Rabbi Akiva's classroom, and he doesn't understand the word. But suddenly, once he hears that it's really the teachings of Moshe applied to new generations, he feels much better. You know what the crowns are on the letters? It's not referring to those tagen. It means that God was making these letters the king so that there's going to come someone in many generations from now who's going to be able to use these letters and apply what's happened in the past to the contemporary sphere. That's what Rabbi Akiva was great at. If you look through the Talmud, you will see that Rabbi Akiva, by far more than anybody else, has real drushos applying the teachings of Moshe to the future generations, to what was happening in that present time. That's what it means. And by the way, Rav Hutner says that answers how Eliyahu Hanavi is going to be the one. We say sometimes when the Gemara is at an impasse, it says teku, that Eliyahu Hanavi is going to answer the question. Why Eliyahu Hanavi? Why did he become the, the, the judge and jury over what's going to happen? Because Eliyahu Hanavi has existed in all generations. He will have been able to see the invention of the cotton gin, the invention of the internet, the creation of modern and old, and he has seen halacha in every generation. That's what the Gemara means, that I've made these letters king. I've made them king. So back to where we were here. Yaakov turns and says, right, Moshe says, no, I went up, right, I went up, so to speak, the angels on their turf. Moshe, as I pointed out, the reason I went on with that Gemara is because Moshe's been up there a lot. Moshe sort of hangs out in God's office, um, so to speak. And that's what it means. Now, Let's bring this medrash to a close to figure out who, in fact, was the greatest. Lefikach Amar Shlomo. Based on all the above, Shlomo HaMelech gets up and says, he wrote Mishle, he wrote the book of Proverbs. Rabos Banos Asu Chayel. Many daughters were valiant. Um, but you, at alit al kulana, you were the greatest of all. You, Moshe, Moses, you are the greatest one in history. As we've seen, every argument, one after the other, Moshe was the greatest. And God says, Hoel venit ale min hakol, since you are greater than all, hu yevarech et Yisrael. Moshe will be the one to bless the Jewish people. And that's, the Medrash now comes full circle, and that's what it means, v'zot habracha. The Torah finishes by saying, and this is the blessing, zot habracha. Why did Moshe get that bracha? Moshe got that bracha because he was the one who had the qualities that were needed to bless the Jewish people. 
I do want to point out one thing before we bring this shear to a close. There is another medrash that's almost similar that compares and asks who is, who is the greatest, but with a different question. The medrash asks who's going to get to lead the benching at the end of time. There's something called the Sudas Mashiach. The Sudas Mashiach is at the end of time, we're going to sit around and eat from the great Leviathan, the Leviathan. Ah, it's going to be a big meal. You ever had a piece, a nice Leviathan sandwich? So at the end, in the Sudas Leviathan, there's a discussion, who gets to lead the benching? Who gets to raise the cup to lead the benching? Guess what? In that Medrash, it's not Moshe. In that Medrash, it's King David. King David is going to be the one to lift up the cup. Why, how, why did over there he win, King David? Because this is talking about who is able to give a bracha to all the Jewish people. That's an issue of covet. Who do we want to give the honor to? Sometimes the one you're giving the honor to is not necessarily the one who may be deemed most worthy of blessing all the people. That's an issue of melech. A melech is a rule that ein kvodo machol. A melech can't forego his honor. So of course the melech gets the honor. But who gets the privilege of blessing the Jewish people? That's going to go to Moshe, who's not a king. But he is the Navi, the greatest of all prophets, and he is the greatest teacher of Torah our genera all generations have ever, have ever had. And he's still teaching in our generation. I thank you for listening to this first shear. Once again, if you want to donate to our series, longestshear.com, we're going for a record 18 hours, support Jewish education. Don't forget, you can text 4144, 4144, text the word Torah. Text for the word Torah, and you'll get instructions that'll follow up, let you know how you can make a contribution and support Jewish education. We thank you so much, and I'll see you in a couple minutes.